Hello, everybody. My name is Kevin Bradley, and welcome to another pre-recorded Facebook event. Now, just so you know, we decided to pre-record these events because it's a much benefit to us where when we push it live to Facebook, there's a few of us on the wings ready to answer all your questions and comments. So when you do watch this, please feel free to add as many comments and questions as you want, and hopefully we can accommodate your answers. Okay, so this is one of our third uh, curriculums that we had done um, last year. Teresa is here with me. Teresa Schumard, welcome. And I also have Justine Amder, who's uh, my sidekick. <laughs> so welcome, Justine. We'll also be in the wings for tonight's presentation. And again, we'll always be there for you to answer some of your questions that may occur when we push it live. This module here really talks about learning about when you get your machine. I do hear a lot of people saying, you know, there's a lack of time between, between having the diagnosis of uh, sleep apnea and by the time you get your machine. I'm sure there's a lot of anticipation. When it arrives, it doesn't really come with an instruction manual. So we thought we would talk you through what this involves when you get it and how your machine works. So basically, PAP or positive airway pressure, if you think about it, it's just really airway pressure that keeps or pressure that keeps your airway open. If you remember in a couple of the other modules that we had done, we did demonstrate a collapsed airway and then an open airway. So we really want to keep that airway opened using that positive airway pressure. Now, if you think about it, it's almost like a hose that is kinked a little bit. And if you're kinking that hose as your water in your garden, for example, it's not getting as much water pressure, but if you let that pressure go, you're gonna get much more. So think about it like that, and it keeps that airway open. Now do remember that PAP, or positive airway pressure, in most cases does not include oxygen. For some people that may also have a secondary diagnosis or primary diagnosis like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, there may be added low percentage oxygen to that machine. But in the most case, it's only the positive airway pressure that helps you have a patent airway at night so that you'll not collapse and have less uh, obstructive events. Great, that was a good explanation with the garden hose. Thank you. So, you know, a brief history of PAP. Really, when you think about it, these machines, when they started off in 1980, were huge. I actually remember being a nurse in, in San Francisco in an ICU in the 90s, and someone brought in a machine. And I kept thinking to myself, it was so loud, it was massive. And I wondered how their sleep partner even got to sleep at night. So Teresa actually reminded me earlier that some people actually used to put it in another room and, and put holes through the wall so that they wouldn't actually hear the noise of the machine. So you can see now how they progress and hopefully most of the people out there that are listening to this have a modern machine, which is no noise. Um, some of these machines actually can fit in the palm of your hand and they're more portable, especially when people want to travel. And the equipment has changed quite dramatically, like you can see. So, you know, the inventor of uh, the CPAP machine, Dr. Colin Sullivan, we actually had an interview with him last year on CPAP Awareness Day, which was April 18th. And he was amazed when he saw a patient overnight um, who had gone through PAP therapy. So the fact that, you know, the person woke up the next day, he was much brighter. He felt like he had a lot of sleep. He felt like he had that good sleep that we all want and wish for and hopefully are getting. And it was those sort of moments when you actually know that this therapy is working for you. And certainly I can attest to that, and I hope the majority of people can as well. I actually remember my sleep study, and then when I went for my sleep trial, 
I did we wake up despite the fact of being in an unusual environment. I did feel a lot more refreshed and thought I actually slept throughout the night. Now also bear in mind before this therapy was invented by Dr. Sullivan, a lot of people that were troubled by this and actually had a lot of problems sleeping at night with obstructive sleep apnea ended up having tracheostomies. So can you imagine if this had not been invented, what we'd all be walking around with? I can't even imagine. So thank you, Dr. Sullivan. And hopefully I think we're going to try and interview him again in 2020 in next April. Yeah, we, um, I'm sure that if you go to the archive videos on uh, Facebook, or if you look at our um, page on YouTube, American Sleep Apnea Association, I know that the interview that we did with Dr. Sullivan in uh, April is, uh, is archived in both of those places. And I thought that it was really interesting because even though on the last slide we spoke about um, how the machine has definitely gotten better and changed and, um, and evolved over the years, uh, I found it interesting that he was surprised that there hasn't been a lot of other uh, inventive uh, treatments for this particular condition. Um, nowadays, I mean, there are several companies out there with various types of uh, implants. Uh, we're still learning about those and, you know, hearing patient stories uh, of people that are, are opting for that treatment. But um, I thought that was interesting that, that he was talking about that. Even though the machine has definitely gotten better and quieter and, and easier to, to use, um, you know, it's, it's still basically the same technology in a way when you break it down, just like your first slide said, it's just blowing air to keep your airway open. Sure. And when you think about it, what a simple idea, a simple idea, but it's so effective. You know, I can attest to that as well. And I'm sure you can. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll see changes throughout uh, the course of the next few years as well to offer people alternatives. Yep. Now, a lot of people when they're, you know, they get the syndrome of, you know, they're told they have obstructive sleep apnea. It is usually a lifelong treatment. Um, there are some people that can make lifestyle adjustments. Now, we did speak to Matt on our last Facebook um, event, and who had gone through gastric surgery, bypass surgery, lost a lot of weight, and maybe it certainly improved the amount of events he had and helped his sleep apnea somewhat. But generally speaking, I feel that this is a lifelong therapy for most people. Now, I think when we go into that, it's like there's some sleep behaviors that can change. And certainly there's environments that you can create that can make it a lot easier for you to have a better night's sleep. In some of the other modules as well, we did discuss about masks. And I did see that a lot in our Facebook Awake page or American Sleep Apnea page, you know, where some people are just not getting the right mask for themselves. For example, if someone has a full mask, they feel like it's too claustrophobic, or if they're mouth breathers, that's maybe what they need. Some people like myself have the nasal mask, which is great for me, I am a nose breather, and I usually just ease into that comfort. But I anticipate this is um, the therapy I'll be using for life. Yes, I, th I definitely think that when individuals make these um, other lifestyle changes, uh, weight loss, <clears throat> other things, that they really still need to speak with their doctor about continuing with the machine. Um, you know, maybe you need to have another sleep study. Maybe it's taken you a couple of years to implement these other changes uh, in your life. And you want to see if it has made any improvement to you know, your apnea events. And so that's something you need to just keep keep talking with about your doctor. Um, and then we have also talked about that um, in the past that you need to also keep in mind that, you know, as we all age, um, things change. So you might have a little bit more of moderate sleep apnea in your 40s and your 50s and have a specific 
um, pressure set for you, but as you get older and everything changes with your tissue and your body, you, those, those pressures might have to change. And so it's always good to, you know, stay in contact uh, with your doctor to make sure you're getting the effective treatment. Sure. And good advice. Well, and, you know, it also has to do with it being one or the other, whether they would be a very severe apneic or whether they are very mild, you know, maybe with certain weight losses and, you know, some things they might be able to use things like positional therapy or something else. They may be able to come out of it maybe with some, you know, ENT surgery. It's every case. It's just so individual uh, that it's important that each person, you know, seek out those answers and seek out those other therapies. Yeah. If they feel that, you know, they can get a little less pressure, but like Justine said, it's usually the other way around. No, and I feel like I wanted to use the analogy of sometimes when people feel, I feel fine now, and maybe someone's really getting good results from their therapy, for example, and then they feel like, well, wow, I'm getting rested every night. Do I really need this? I wouldn't be complacent. Thankfully, these days, a lot of machines and a lot of the technology can monitor. Uh, you can get a reading every day what your AHI is, your apneic hypopneic index. So don't get too complacent by feeling, wow, I'm not uh, having these many events anymore. I don't need it. And again, to use the analogy, sometimes I have patients that come into our clinic and they say, I feel better now that I'm on a high blood pressure medication. I don't get the headaches anymore. So I stopped. Uh, that's because you were having your antihypertensive medication that you weren't having these headaches. Uh, so, you know, just be mindful of that as well. It's the reason you're feeling better and the reason you're getting good sleep is because of the therapy. And again, monitor that as well. I just wanted to touch on something really quickly that Teresa said, uh, because it is very true that everybody's uh, journey uh, is, is very different and is um, a different combination uh, for them to be successful. And that's why it's so important for all of us to uh, get together, whether it's here on Facebook or on our forum or, you know, attend the in-person meetings or awake groups to you know, share a little bit about yourself, your story, what's working, what's not, because you know, as all of us are individuals, there's definitely someone out there that's you know trying to come overcome the same hurdles that you did. Yes. So uh, it, it's very helpful for other people to hear. Oh well, you know, I didn't think about going to the ENT, or I didn't think about seeing the allergist, or I didn't think about asking my doctor about this. And, um, you know, you get to pay it forward by, by uh, sharing that journey that you had. Sure, Justine, and I'm a big advocate for that as well. And we see that on our um, Awake Facebook pages that, you know, people are helping each other, which is great because my experience may not be the same as someone else's and I may not have had the same experience as someone. So I don't have the tools to help people because that's not something I experienced, for example. So it's great to uh, share your experiences with it, good and bad, and help each other through it. It's, it's very, very valuable. This peer-to-peer -peer support is, is huge. We have such a supportive community in our uh, support group. I am just every day so thankful for the people that come in there and give their honest and positive uh, feedback to people that are just starting out and they're scared. So it's just, it's just really, and, and, and nobody gets uh, ugly or anything. Everything is positive and they try to help truly. So we're lucky, we're lucky. Very valuable, very valuable. So the pop pressure relief, pressure assistance is, you know, some people, and I do see this again on our pages where people feel like they're suffocating. Um, of course, you know, the therapy is a lot easier on inspiration. So when you're breathing in and you're getting that positive airway pressure, that's when you feel like you're getting good oxygenation into your lungs. But some people are experiencing, you know, that pressure when they exhale. Pat pressure relief lowers the pressure when you exhale. 
Okay, so that'll help push against that. Quite personally, I've never really experienced that. Only when I had the actual little nasal cannulas that actually fit into my nostrils. And if they weren't positioned correctly, then I would feel like I was breathing or exhaling against somewhat of a pressure. Now, now I'm lucky I have, you know, a silicone mask that doesn't actually have the two little pillows or cushions that, are, that sit in my nostrils and it actually just sits right under my nose. So I, I don't experience that. But, um, you know, some of the pressure auto support um, senses when you're breathing into the machine and can cut back a little bit when you exhale. Now, there's no need to push the on button on my machine either, and I love that because if I happen to get up during the night, um, you know, I can either turn off my machine or turn it back on or just leave it there. And as soon as I start breathing into that mask, the pressure comes on and I don't actually have to re-push the button on and off again. So it's beneficial for people to have that when they're getting up maybe in the middle of the night or not. My machine usually does turn off, and I think most do if you're not using it for a period of time. So that, that is especially good for me in the middle of the night if I get up. If you're not familiar with um, this, these types of options on your machine, you definitely need to reach out to your uh, doctor's office uh, for a little bit of training or reach out to your DME or, or home health care provider uh, to, to ask these questions because every machine is a little different in how to possibly turn these features on or, you know, set them to different um, uh, settings. Uh, so you could just reach out to them and they'll be able to help you. Great point, actually, Justin, because, you know, my machine initially had not been set to turn off. And one morning I got up quite quickly because I was on call and my pager went off and I just ripped off my mask and went out and worked all day. And I came back and my machine was still on. So, you know, that could be detrimental to the integrity of the, the machine as well. And of course, the humidifier ran dry, which leads us nicely into the next slide. So for me, I remember, um, you know, the last uh, event we did, we interviewed Janice, who was given a CPAP machine as a trial without a humidifier. And I meant to maybe elaborate a little bit more than that, because I felt like, for me, I really value the humidifier. Now, it did take me a little bit of while to figure out what a good setting is for me. And I think it's around four or five. Because I was getting a little bit of, you know, over-humidifier, of over-humidification, sorry, um, that actually caused a little bit of condensation and what they would refer to as rain out in the tube. So I could hear that at night and it was actually keeping me awake. Um, I could hear the tube gurgling during the night. There are covers that one can buy to, to help prevent that. Another thing that I noticed as well is I used to have my machine a little bit higher than um, it was on the dresser beside my bed. It was a little bit higher. So I think the water and humidification or would just lay in the tubing and create a noise as well. So now I keep it a little bit lower. I actually have a pull-out drawer where I can put my machine in and leave the drawer open, obviously, when it's on. Um, but for some people, you know, it's a, an indi individual uh, preference. Some people like a lot of humidification because they feel it helps with, for example, uh, nasal congestion or may, you know, help alleviate some allergies that someone's suffering from. There's also the availability of the climate control heating tube um, that can be helpful for people in different climates. Now, an added note to that, and I've actually seen a couple of questions recently on our Awake Facebook page where people were asking whether they should use distilled water or tap water. When I traveled one time and I didn't have the availability for the first three or four days to actually get distilled water, I did notice a lot of residue and mineral buildup in the chamber of the humidifier. So I always use distilled water. Um, it's a lot cleaner 
and it's easier to keep your machine clean as well. Yeah, I think, you know, just depending on <clears throat> where people live and, you know, the weather that's that's outside and the temperature that you like your house and the change of seasons kind of sometimes will, um, you'll need to adjust the, uh, the level of the humidification on your machine. And like I said in the, on the last slide, if you have any uh, questions on how to do that, you know, you can reach out to your uh, healthcare provider uh, to, to be able to raise or lower it um, because that's, that's something that's very easy to do and might make um, using the machine way more comfortable than it is right now if you're having an issue. Great advice, yes. So the ramp up feature is something I don't have in my machine, although I am excited that the, at the end of the year, I'm eligible for a new machine. And, um, but this is something that people find a benefit when they want to ease into a pressure as they go to sleep. Now, again, this is very individualized. And for me, I remember when I got my machine at first, Adam Amdur had said to me, you know, sit and read or watch the TV and just get used to that airflow that's going in and breathe out and breathe in with it so that it's not the first thing that you put on at night when you're going to bed. You're all already trying to acclimatize or get accustomed to that feeling and that pressure. Now, of course, with a ramp up feature that can help because as you ease into your sleep, it can then gradually go up in the pressure until you get to your optimized pressure. But as we talked about earlier on, some people may fall. I, I actually fall asleep quite quickly. So maybe I need that pressure and that ramp up sooner than it's available, for example, while others may feel like they need it, you know, maybe half an hour later. So again, it's again, like Justine had said before with a lot of, Things that may need tweaking with the machine and therapy, speak to your provider and talk to them about how you can make this happen so it best suits your individual need. And I think, uh, Teresa, correct me if I'm wrong, but most of the features that we just talked about now, you know, are available to you on your you know, uh, patient menu, the user menu for the machine that you have. Um, that, you know, once someone shows you how to access the ramp and how to change the humidification, you can do those things on, on your own. You don't have to take your machine to your physician to have them do it. You just need somebody to, to show you. Um, you could probably even Google the um, operating manual <laughs> for your machine <laughs> and kind of go through that uh, if you're so inclined um, to, you know, to, to look at the, at the manuals. And so, you know, you don't need any sort of prescription to, to you know, or, or doctor's guidance to change these. Um, Adam, uh, uh, Adam was talking uh, to us before and also pointed out that, you know, when you are struggling a little bit with, with maybe using the machine, um, it's sometimes best to change or work on one variable at a time, um, you know, to see what is actually maybe happening that you, that's causing you to have um, a hard time using it. So if you change the ramp and the humidification and you move the machine up or down and do all these things and change your sleeping position all at once and it's still not working, well, then you don't really know what to adjust next. But if you just take one at a time, okay, I, I move this up, I move this down, okay, this isn't working, let's try this other, you know, tactic to see if it's helping me. Um, I know you, you kind of you are getting frustrated sometimes, you wanna do everything at once, but then um, if it doesn't work, you might actually be skipping over uh, an important thing that if you just tweaked it a little more would get you comfortable with the machine. So best to kind of just do one thing at a time. Yeah. Well, another point there, is it's very important. I mean, you, you, you might be a little fatigued. You might still feel like you're in that fog and maybe your therapy is not optimal for you at this point yet. To keep a little notebook, 
about what you've tried. Sort of a, you don't have to keep a formal diary, but, you know, chart down, you know, oh, this night I tried this and how did I feel the next morning or what happened during the night? That way you have it when you go to speak to the provider, if need be, that you have an accurate uh, description of your particular situation. And I uh, wanted to mention something Justine had suggested about the manufacturer's um, documents for operating the machinery. If you put in the name of your machine and then put manual in Google, you will come up with all the, the user manuals if you have lost yours. A lot of times we misplace those when we unpack things. <laughs> good. good advice. Very good advice. You know, and some of these algorithms as well are important just to, to be aware of. But generally speaking, it's the same box, maybe with a different pressure, depending on what your need is, right? So APAP is the auto-adjusting pressure or pressure that can be variable between the prescribed minimum and maximum levels and works on maybe how you're breathing yourself. So it'll adjust to your need. CPAP is the fixed pressure or a single pressure level that's um, usually prescribed to you after you've had your sleep study and your CPAP trial and they feel that this is where you um, get your maximum um, pressure that allows you to sleep comfortably. And then, of course, BiPAP is the two prescribed fixed pressure levels of your inhalation and one for your exhalation. So, you know, a couple of algorithms that mean different things, but generally speaking, the machine actually just delivers the same type of therapy in different modes. One thing about pressure, I think, is that especially for um, newer patients dealing with their is that um, you can have the same type of feeling, meaning like I can't breathe or I'm feeling a little claustrophobic if the pressure is too high or the pressure is too low. A lot of people think that it's maybe just the high one. You know, like, oh, this is too much, this pressure is too high, I can't, I can't uh, I'm not going to be able to use it. Well, you know, in some cases it might actually, you might be feeling like that because it's too low and your, and your, uh, your uh, uh, obstruction is actually maybe a little bit more, like creating a, a tighter space and so that stent needs to be a little bit, uh, the pressure needs to be a little bit higher so it opens more so you can actually feel, you know, your lungs filling up. Um, so that's just something, you know, for, for, for some people that have been uh, recently diagnosed and are, are trying to, you know, get used to, to their therapy. Great advice, because it sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? When you feel like you're feeling like that suffocation, but you think that's because the pressure is too high. But you're right, it's great highlighting that because it actually could be the fact that it's too low. Mm-hmm. So this slide's important, and I think, you know, when I first, I, I did touch on this a little bit earlier on in the presentation where I got myself accustomed to the machine and the therapy and the sensation by sitting and watching TV, for example, or reading. Um, so then it was nothing new to me when I would try and go to sleep at night. I felt like, you know, I can do this. I'm relaxing and I can feel that sensation of the air blowing in and me, my inspirations are okay and my exhalations are fine. So, you know, this is a great slide as well. And we advocate that, you know, you do also create a good sleep environment. We've had segments on that on our prior presentations before, where it's important to encompass all aspects of creating that good, healthy sleep environment. I'm going to actually ask Teresa to read this so eloquently like she does, because it's worth noting that this is something that you may want to practice. Well, this, this is something that, especially if you are starting your CPAP for the first time tonight, or if you are going to be starting it, you could always replay this. But this is simply having your whole being relax, not just 
your throat, not just, but, you know, completely relaxing and getting a, a visual imagery of what is going on physiologically with your upper airway. Uh, in imagining that that upper airway is being kept open by this invisible splint of pressure that we talked about before. So take some big, deep breaths and completely relax. Put the mask on your face as you turn the unit on. Relax. Close your eyes. Clear your mind of all thoughts. Keep your lips closed, but don't tense your lips. Let the pressure fill the back of your throat and imagine that your upper airway is being kept open by the pressure. Breathe with it, not against it. Breathe slowly, concentrate, and relax. And that is simply something I used to be a sleep technician, and that is something that I used to help you know, the patients relax with because it was, you know, sometimes it's a little bit of a, a challenge to put something like that on your face and, and relax, but that is key, especially if you're having claustrophobic feelings. But if you can, if you can think about your throat and feel your throat opening, it's going to make all the difference. So I encourage you to share that dialogue with your your family and friends that may be using uh, CPAP for the first time. Wonderful, Trezo. You know, we should have started with that slide because I feel totally relaxed now. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there's a lot of also things out there online or podcasts that may help people as well as they adjust or even want to sleep each night and have trouble falling asleep where... Before, you know, there's lots of exercises where you're starting from your toes right up to your Mm -hmm. neck and shoulders and head and just totally relaxing, tensing and relaxing each muscle until, excuse me, until you work up the to the point of whether your shoulders and your head even that you actually feel by that time that that's completed. Your body's actually really relaxed, and you probably don't even realize you've got the the mask on after a while. So reach out if you're having trouble with it, and um, maybe we could actually do get Teresa to do a recording of this because that that worked really well. Um, but look at other podcasts and, and avenues out there to help you relax and and be um, comfortable with your therapy. Well, that was one of the things that. Um uh, Janice talked about uh, on the last event that we had was, um, you know, the online support that she received. Um, she, you know, wasn't sure she was going to be able to do it. She wasn't sure she liked it. She didn't want to wear it. And, um, you know, she she reached out to, to uh, 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 there's different types of communities. You know, we have one, there's uh, lots, lots online. And, you know, kind of got the support and the tough love and the suggestions and everything that she needed to stick with uh, stick with the therapy. And, you know, she feels so much better now. Um, and so, you know, everyone was in the same boat when they started. Um, you have the lucky people that, are, you know, are just able to put the mask on and fall asleep immediately. You have the people that struggled with various things in the middle, the fitting of the mask, type of mask, all that stuff. And then, you know, you had someone like Janice that was just sure she wasn't going to be able to do it, didn't want to do it. And here she is, you know, a panelist at one of our meetings and talking on a a live event about, um, you know, how how using the CPAP machine has, you know, changed uh, changed her life and made her feel so much better. So, you know, it can can happen even if if it's the um, even if you're in that 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 most difficult category, it can turn around for you just by, um, you know, looking at each step of the process. Sure. And I mean, I think, you know, it's always great when people do, you know, stick with it. Of course, that's what we want. We want you to be comfortable with your therapy so it gives you the best possible results out there. But I think, as you said, too, Justine, Janice was able to wake up during the middle of the night and still get responses because of, you know, maybe time difference and stuff. And people were always there for her. Mm -hmm. So, you know, don't feel alone and don't go through this alone and don't give up. Mm -hmm. 
So again, because this is a pre-recorded session, any questions and um, comments you may have, um, we're going to be on the wings when we push this live to answer those. And sometimes these are ongoing because obviously people watch these just after the live or it's pushed to Facebook event uh, occurs. So continue to comment, um, add your feedback. We always appreciate that as well. And um, again, hopefully this was beneficial to you. I want to thank uh, Justine and Teresa for also being here and lending their experience and their expertise. Uh, but we'll be here for you. Um, and we encourage everybody to be there for each other moving forward. So thank you so much and have a wonderful night. Happy holidays. It's going to probably be Thanksgiving soon. <laughs> Happy holidays. I, I, you know, I thought I would mention that. And I, thank you for reminding me. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.